hear a little squabbling or a little uh, some digs in here. Um, Tom, just before we get started, do you want to do a very quick explanation of what the Barnes Foundation is if anyone uh, isn't familiar with it? Sure. So the Barnes Foundation is uh, one of the most significant uh, collections in the world of uh, impressionist, post-impressionist, and early modernist art, principally Western European art. Uh, Dr. Albert C. Barnes, who is a Philadelphia entrepreneur, built the collection here over the course of about 40 years from the first decade of the 20th century. And over time, he also added to that collection of significant paintings, principally French, uh, material culture and art from throughout the world. So it also, we have a great African collection, great oceanic material, great Native American material, and he did something very unusual. He was interested in teaching, and he was interested in using the collection as the focus for an educational project that came out of Dewey and pragmatic philosophy and psychology, and the idea was to sit in front of these ensembles of pictures and objects that he put together very deliberately and encourage people to think, to look actively and to speak about what they saw in a project of self-improvement through cultivated self-awareness. It was a very kind of progressive project in 1925 when the foundation opened to the public. Uh, today we have now moved, we've relocated to the parkway, we're right next to the Rodin Museum in a building that was designed by Todd Williams and Billy Chen for us and we also have a changing exhibition program and a very, very active education and social services uh, program array. So that's what we do today. Yeah. So what we wanted to talk about a little bit today is the museum and the kinds of things that, that Tom and his team have been doing, but also really the idea of the museum space as a hospitality space and the ways that that can inform hospitality practice both in other museums as well as in the kinds of projects that we're developing and that we're doing. And I know you wanted to start with a quote. Well, first I wanted to say, in the interest of full disclosure, I was very excited when we received this invitation because I thought this was gonna be my chance to complain about how bad hotel art typically is to people who can actually do something about it. Um, but as you can imagine, Matt likes and, and, and admires so many people here, I thought I would, I would leave that to the side. Um, <laughs> but I just want you to know as a little bit of, a, of a, a button, maybe we can come back to it in the Q&A later, that I typically refer to this, with all apologies to the political philosopher Haran, Hannah Arendt, as the evil of banality um, hotel art. So we can come back to that later. Uh, so, <laughs> so do you want to talk sure. a little bit about Olivia so, Lang? So we were sort of talking, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the space that the museum shares with the hospitality uh, industry. Um, and my favorite, one of my favorite uh, contemporary art critics is Olivia Lang. Some of you may know her work. She's also a novelist. And she said this about uh, her experience of artists and museums. She said, there are museums and artists who have taught, what it taught us what it means to be fully human because of their engagement and their generosity, their hospitality. What I mean by hospitality is a capacity to enlarge and open, a corrective to the overwhelming political imperative in ascendance just this decade to wall off, separate, and reject. So this is what we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, today, I hope. So a lot of people have early experience of museum as kids and think of it as a very formal space, a space that you have to whisper and be quiet and you can't run or get enthusiastic or excited about what you see. And it's sort of like maybe a slightly more aesthetic version of going to the dentist. It feels compulsory. Um, I know that in the last 20, 30 years, museum practice has changed dramatically and your work has, has been very focused on that actually. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of the museum as a temple and then how that's transformed? So, so here's the nickel history of the public museum. The public museum in the West is, was invented at the end of the 18th century. It was really part of the Enlightenment project of creating a kind of human-focused, science-based, and non-theological uh, experience of the world, a kind of frame for social experience. And so the first public museums in the West were museums where, in which aristocratic and, and monarchic collections were just opened to the public. And over the course of the 19th century, in the process of industrialization and the, and the growing populations in cities where these collections were located, the project evolved to a place where, essentially, uh, it was the idea that the great 
unwashed masses on their one day a week off of work would come and in a kind of private encounter, one-on-one -on -one with a picture or object, have a kind of transcendent experience through pure aesthetics that was akin to but uh, the religious transcendent experience, but minus the theology, right? This is the enlightenment, right? So, uh, and this really is how the museum is born in the West, and I would say almost until the end of the First World War, maybe even to the early 20s, most of the museums built in, in Western Europe and the United States look the same for the same reason, which is to say, and Philadelphia is a great example, they were built to resemble classical temples. They were typically built in cities but surrounded by parks, elevated above the fray, right, of a kind of dirty industrial city. And the idea was you would go in with no didactic support, no introduction, no labels, and you would simply find a thing that resonated with you aesthetically. And, and standing there in private reverie, you would be reminded of your own capacity, right, for insight, engagement, intellection, and so forth. So, so that's how it all began. That's why all these buildings look like temples. That's why they're mostly in parks, rundown parks generally, but they're all in parks now. And this really was the paradigm, the reigning paradigm of the museum in the West really until about 30 years ago, when pressures both inside the museum and most of those pressures had to do with the necessity of generating earned revenue as, uh, as philanthropic support from the noblesse oblige was no longer enough to keep these institutions going. So pressure from inside to build an earned revenue model and an operation that supported earned revenue, but also from the outside. So feminist politics, feminist critique, anti-colonialism, anti-racism, pressure from the outside, social, political, critical pressure for the institution to take a look at itself and to recenter, to change the way collections were built, to change the way exhibition programs were organized, which, you know, 25 years ago, when I, I, my, I was a curator at Museum of Modern Art early in my career, and the first show I pitched there was a, a solo project by Carrie Mae Weems, who is a MacArthur award-winning photo and installation artist who is African-American, and if I could tell you the response to the presentation of this uh, in 1995, 1994, I wouldn't be exaggerating to say that there was kind of shock and awe. So, so it wasn't that long ago, but subsequently, through these pressures, through a kind of evolution in the educational practice, and of course, the funding model is an important part of this, there is now increasing pressure for institutions to build programs and build collections that look like the cities in which they exist, serving the populations, mirroring the diversity of the populations in the surrounding communities. So that's where this evolved over the course of the subsequent, let's say, let's say in the last 30, maybe 40 years. And there are plenty of museums that are still holdouts. So if you go to the Museum of Modern Art now, right, it was founded in 1929, to this day, Georgia O'Keeffe, Arthur Dove, Andrew Wyeth, that are not part of the modernist story are out by the water fountain. Wilfred Olam out by the coat room, right? They just don't know what to do with this material because the paradigm hasn't shifted there completely. So you've been involved in the design of several museums now at this point, obviously not with the Barnes, which has been you know, uh, a very kind of enshrined presentation, um, but you've programmed and planned museums and one of the things that you've been looking at is how you make a complete experience in the museum rather than only this sort of original aesthetic primary experience? So I've had the privilege of being part of the creation of three new freestanding museum buildings. I worked with Zaha Hadid in Cincinnati on the Contemporary Art Center. I worked in Miami with Herzog and Demuron on, the, on what was the Miami Art Museum. It's now called the Paris Art Museum Miami. And now I'm working on the, we're building a Calder Museum. The Calder family was located here, educated based in Philadelphia. So we're building a new museum uh, about the, the history and work of the Calder family across the street from the Rodin Museum on the Parkway. So the great privilege there is you don't have to yank a 19th century institution into the 21st century if you get to reinvent it from the ground up. And of course, the architecture, it's where it all starts. You have to have an idea of what a mission-aligned program looks like. And from that, you generate your building program. And in all three of those cases, you, you, if you know those buildings, they're all very different, uh, very different buildings. And the, the HDM building for Philadelphia is gonna be largely underground, so you can use your, use your imagination about that. So 
you have a mission aligned programmatic idea about what your service should look like, which is collections, exhibitions, education, and social service. Um, and then the building really has to respond to that. The building program has to do that. Miami is the best example. If you know the Miami building, you will know that it is completely nonlinear. So when we worked with HDM, we said we wanted to build a program here that reflects the fact that Miami is among the most diverse cities in the United States, and it looks like, in terms of population, many cities in the country will look like in the coming decades, right? So we want to build a collection and a program that is hemispheric, that looks at North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and the African diaspora influence there. But we don't want to tell the same old linear narrative about the evolution of modernism through ever greater degrees of abstraction to pure conceptual art. Instead, we want a building that has a cluster of exhibition spaces that resists the possibility of linear narrative. Because of course, linear narrative, right, is forecloses on the possibility of surprise and chance, and it puts you in a story that you can't get out of. So they designed a building for us that has a cluster of spaces that sort of slip together, and you can't create a linear narrative there, much as you might try. So it's very deliberate. One example of how the building program echoes the, the mission-specific nature of the service. So I want to um, give you props. Uh, oh, Tom's work has very much inspired the... In 25 years, <laughs> we had to do a public presentation <laughs> together to get to this moment. This is a very important moment in our relationship. This is an exaggeration. Um, uh, you introduced me to the idea of the heterotopia, which I want you to talk about a little bit. And that has really inspired the work that we've done as a firm in hotel design. And one of the reasons I think a lot of us love hospitality, and particularly now in this world where we're very segmented, and there's less and less ways that we overlap with people that have different ideas, different experiences, different values, but hotels and hospitality spaces are still those spaces. And when we're working on the design of hotels, we're assuming that the guests that are coming have the most open mind that they will ever have. That people in transit and traveling sort of physically, <laughs> mentally, cognitively just are open and they need to be more open than they are when they're grounded. And that idea of the heterotopia has been very, very influential for me in thinking about designing hospitality spaces. Can you talk a little bit about how that's influenced what you've done in exhibitions and in museums? Sure, so, so the, the, the museum paradigm I began with, right, the temple on a hill, is all about private experience. It's about the internal, and one could argue that the nature of the building and the collections and the lack of didactic materials and all this stuff actually make it a kind of antisocial experience, right? You're supposed to leave the dirty city and your experience behind and come in, have this private transcendent experience that in theory transforms you as a person, but it is an asocial at best, and I would argue an antisocial idea. So you all know the concept of utopia, right? A utopia is a fantasy place that is constructed so that it reflects on really existing conditions in the world in which it was generated. But because it's a perfect model, it can never exist. So the word utopia actually builds into it, the wordplay, a utopia in its derivation is definitionally a place that is perfect and can never exist. So that's the word utopia. Heterotopia is this idea that comes out of literary criticism and then social theory that there are places, real places in our world, not these fantastic fictional places. There are real places in the fabric of our sheer, shared experience that can be designed, programmed, and activated to be the opposite of that, that liminal private experience, that they can actually be engines for new kinds of progressive social engagements, social experiences. The idea that the heterotopia, right, hetero, different, right? So, so it, the heterotopia is a space in the fabric of your experience that is designed to be different than significant aspects of the world right outside its front door, right? So if, does, does that make sense? I mean, it's a little bit abstract, but if you think about it, there are precious few places in our shared experience now the town square, right? Where you just encounter people you don't know and have to be subject to their ideas and have to deal with them dialogically and right? And that's how social change happens, right? Change happens in these interactions. The socius, the social body is all about dialogical progress. That's the only way we progress, right? It's Hegel's idea that you, know, you have an idea of the world, 
but then you're in the world. And being in the world makes you change your idea in response to really existing conditions. So then you develop a new idea of the world. And this is how progress happens. So what do those spaces look like? And the argument, to the extent there is an argument here, is that both the properly designed and programmed museum and the properly designed and programmed hospitality environment can be these kinds of spaces where real, you, where people have experiences and encounter ideas that change the way they think, feel, and behave when they go back out into the world. I mean, it's kind of a profound idea. And if you think about where those, what other places are, there aren't too many places like this in our shared experience, right? So, so, so that's where we, that's where we are in this situation. It's so this idea of the heterotopia, right? Think alternative social experiences, the encounter of alternative ideas in those social experiences that change the way individuals and therefore social groups can think, feel, and behave once they leave. I want to ask you about a very specific thing that you did recently, which is to really change something that's very embedded in museum experience, that typically there are guards wearing security-like uniforms that make them all look the same, and guards in museums are typically told not to speak to the visitors, and have, even though they've spent more time than anyone else looking at the pieces in the galleries that they're in, they're not to communicate with the visitors. And I think this is really an interesting parallel to what happens in hospitality, that we have people that are trained to be very guest-facing, and then we also still have a big part of our teams that are basically trained to be invisible. And it's a problematic thing, especially after this year of really looking at equity and representation and, and justice. Um, and I want you to just tell a little bit about sort of how you've changed the way security works or your frontline team works. I think it would be interesting to, to everybody here. So, so just to be really concrete, something else that both the museum and, the ho and hospitality environments share, right, is that they have to generate revenue and they have to create memorable experiences, right? So this is the experience economy idea. And as the museum was opening up in the 80s and 90s, this idea actually caught on in the museum world too. So like hospitality environments, really successful museums have, right, spaces to gather, they have retail opportunities, they have opportunities to dine and gather, and then they have catalytic experiences that come both through things, in the case of the museum it's art, but also in experiences with other people. So the casual social gathering, the surprise encounter on the elevator, um, but also the frontline staff. And the art museum has been very, I mean, you know, I told you where it came from, right? It's a very elitist project. And it's still a very elitist project, although we work very hard against that now. But it's still a very elitist project. And part of that elitist project is nobody can talk about the art or the history or the institutional mandate or anything except the professional staff, right? And you know this. You go to museums. I mean, you, you know that the people that work on the front lines of museums, particularly security staff and visitor services staff, are, are among the longest tenured people in museums, which is surprising, right? Because the, the wages aren't great and, and the hours are terrible and you would think it would be incredibly boring. So the people that have these long tenures are there because they love the institution and because they also benefit from their experience there. So, so we started to think about, and they also, of course, are typically populations that look most like the cities, right, in which they exist. I mean, my, you know, my chief curator's from London, right? You know, this is professional staff stuff. But the staff, the frontline staff, looks exactly like the city of Philadelphia, mirrors in every way the diversity of the city of Philadelphia. Um, and we, we realized, you know, these are people that love this institution. Many of them been there a long time. So about two years ago, we devised a project where we, we brought, th these were all hourly employees. Many of them were contract employees with, um, uh, from other vendors. And we decided we're gonna invite everyone on the frontline staff to become a staff member, full-time staff member. We're gonna give them all benefits. And then we are going to change the way we engage our frontline colleagues in the project of education, right, social engagement, and so forth. So we created something called the Pathways Program, which, which takes off from the idea that everybody should know about the institutional history, everyone should know about and feel comfortable speaking to the public about what's happening in the galleries. So we did that first, and we, of course, continue to do that as 
new waves of, of colleagues roll through. But then the other thing that we did was we said, maybe you don't all want to stay here in the gallery all the time, standing here, telling people not to touch. Um, and so we also created a program where people can opt into job shadowing, internships, in gallery or in museum education with the idea that they can either move into other parts of the operation, whether it's retail or advancement or marketing, or it, you know, maybe in the best case scenario, they can take that training and go out into the world and get an even better job, right? So, um, and what it does is it, it, it doesn't rely on the envelope or even the programmatic contents to make that, to animate the dynamic I talked about, this kind of catalytic progressive dynamic. What it insists on is that you think about every aspect of the operation, right? The art, of course, an important potential catalyst, and we can talk about that because I do think we can all do better. Most of us can do better, uh, including us. And, but it's also, you have to activate it. This doesn't happen if you're passive about it, right? The building does part of it, the interiors do part of it, the actual experiences, the hospitality experiences are part of it. In my case, the art is part of it, education. But you have to do it consciously, self-critically, and actively. And so for us, thinking through every part of the operation, including the kind of frontline staff piece, and it's made an enormous difference. I cannot tell you, I can't tell you how many people, when we started doing this, you know, said to me, I, I had this great conversation. You know, they, they passed these people a million times, right? We have people that have been at the Barnes for 20 years um, in the galleries. How many people say, I've never spoken to this person before and I got into this active conversation about some substantive thing in the gallery or some aspect of our significant institutional history, which in the case of Dr. Barnes involves a lot of activism around social justice uh, in the first half of the 20th century. So another interesting um, jumping off point for thinking about what we could be doing programmatically to catalyze this kind of experience that we're talking about. And it, it is at the end of the day catalytic. If you think about it as a product, rather than a process, you get stuck on that retail piece. But if you think about everything that happens in that space, catalyzing right, a change in the way someone thinks, feels, and behaves once they leave your hospitality establishment, you t I think you can take it to a whole other level. And I also think it's good for our shared project of living together in this world. And it sounds very Pollyannish. And I'm not very Pollyannish at all. <laughs> So we've, we've talked a lot. We still have a few minutes, and I'm sure there could be questions from here. And if not, then we'll just ask each other questions. Does anyone have any? Uh, oh, I need the money? Oh, OK. <laughs> he handed me a mic. He doesn't know me very well <laughs> enough yet. Um, for Tom, I think, what is your advice to everybody here from a curation standpoint? I know you're joking about the art in the rooms, but how do we balance the, not joking, joking, but um, how do you balance the appreciation for art and curation and, and going into a place like yours and balancing that with the financial aspect, the demand, the supply chain of everything, and what do you, what's your advice to the people in this room to help give that impression? Well, well, my sense is, right, that this kind of approach to creating environments where any art object is thoroughly anodyne, like, right, you can't, you can't attract, unless you're 21C or whatever, and that's, that's central to your brand, it has to be, you know, it has to blend in, right? It can't be provocative, it can't be challenging, and I had an experience, and we talk about this a lot, I had an experience when I, we worked with uh, Zaha Hadid on this building, we were getting ready to open the building in Cincinnati, and we were thinking about uh, audience development moving forward, and, and Procter and & Gamble, as you probably know, is headquartered there, and they were big supporters of the museum, so they sponsored a series of focus groups for us. We were moving from one museum building to another, so just growing an existing museum. So they set up a series of focus groups that involved all of our, all all the people that had been longtime members of the institution or repeat ticket buyers over the course of years, they were people that for one reason or another had honed very closely to the museum project. They were really part of the life of the institution for a long time to find out why. And I think this is really relevant to answer this question. And what we discovered, and this was, I think it's it's Matt's pacemaker.
No worries. So the, um, uh, and what we discover, and this, I think this is kind of amazing, so think about this. You know, it's a contemporary art museum, and we are, you know, multiple exhibitions a year, it's constantly changing, and this is, a lot of this is work that's new and not tested, and a lot of it's very provocative. And what we found about these people is they all said, we don't necessarily like the art, but we keep coming back because we like being exposed to new ideas and being new, offered new experiences with other people who have the same approach to being in the world. It wasn't about the art at all, right? The art was, at best, a catalyst for most of these people that helped build a relationship with the institution. And I think the fear, right, is that you don't want to do anything that will offend anyone or install any work that, that people find jarring or unpleasant. But think of that as an opportunity. Think of it as an opportunity to seed conversation, to provoke discussion to create a lasting impression, right? In the experience economy, what's the product? The product is the memory trace, right? Well, art, challenging art, is a way to create a, me a meaningful memory trace. And as with these, and this is Cincinnati, right? This place was founded by Germans. They don't like, I mean, you know, they're, they're, these are not like risk take, this is not a risk taking population. If you know anything about Cincinnati, you know what I'm talking about. So they, uh, but the idea that even in this very conservative population, they, we, don't, this, we don't like the art. A lot of the time we don't like the art. But we love being challenged. We love being spoken to as people that we are understood as risk taking and so forth. And we like being around other people that have the same way of being in the world. So, so think about that. If, if the resistance is, I don't want to offend, I don't want to provoke, I don't want to disturb, OK, maybe you don't. But perhaps there's a brand specific way to think about art, at least in public spaces, as catalytic in this kind of social exchange. Okay, please go ahead. How's it going? Uh, I'm Daniel. I run a restaurant in uh, Center City that we uh, call Mission Taqueria. And we reference third place a lot in our. Manuel, we, I just uh, was intrigued by your idea of heterotopia and uh, creating that impact for people. And we try to do that in hospitality on our level. But I'm curious from you what your, uh, what some good examples of heterotopian places are in Philadelphia for you? And you can't say the barns. It's, it's, a, no, it's a great question. I mean, my point really is, and, and I didn't invent this idea, right? This is Michel Foucault, the sort of great philosopher and historian. This is his idea, um, and he arrived at, it, at this idea in the wake of what happened in Paris in 1968. He was teaching at the Sorbonne, you know. And, and he, what he pointed out was there used to be many more of these spaces when we were principally pedestrian, when we were agrarian. There was the town square. There was the church, right? There might be a, a collective shopping experience somewhere in, in, in a kind of older social, uh, urban social model. They're really going away. I mean, the university is a place like this. Um, there are uh, performance spaces that are programmed this way. That, I mean, to deliver it. You know, the, the issue here is if, if what you're presenting, people already know, and this is, this is also not my idea. This is Bertolt Brecht, right? The idea that you can't teach anyone anything new if you don't teach them in a new way through a new form. You can't teach them anything truly new. And so there are precious few of those places because everything's commercialized now, right? So nobody wants to take any risks. Nobody wants to provoke. Nobody wants to offend. Everybody wants a clean uh, you know, transaction and no relationship. So hospitality environment, museum, university, some uh, in Philadelphia, we have a great public library system where people, uh, you know, strangers from a variety of different social strata and different backgrounds mix uh, all the time uh, in the city. But there are precious few of these places. I mean, that's precisely the issue. And the hospitality environment is a place where you can do both, right? It can be a successful retail environment. You can actually, because we, I mean, that's how we stay open. You can earn revenue without compromising this part of your commitment. And I think that's what's unusual about the hospitality environment, as opposed to, you know, the Amazon store. Mic <laughs> <Like> drop. <laughs>